Welcome to the podcast series, Reducing the Risk of Severe Illness for Patients with COVID-19. This podcast is part of a micro-learning library on the testing, diagnosis, and treatment of severe illness for patients with COVID-19. This education is brought to you by the France Foundation and supported by an educational grant from Pfizer. Listen as Drs. Alvaro Galvis, a Pediatric Infectious Disease Fellow at the University of California, Irvine, and Victor Cisneros, an Emergency Medicine Physician at Eisenhower Hospital, discuss identifying and addressing barriers to appropriate testing for COVID-19. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We have another episode here. I'm Victor Cisneros. I have here Dr. Alvaro Galvis. We're going to talk about an exciting topic, identifying and addressing barriers to appropriate COVID testing. Dr. Galvez, welcome back. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm excited about this topic. It's hit close to home. Yeah, no, this is a very important topic. I think, you know, as we know, the social determinants of health are probably most important when um, affecting what healthcare outcomes in terms of our patient population. And so I think identifying these barriers, and there's three kind of things that we've kind of highlighted here, you know, that we're going to talk about is uh, planning, processing, and outcomes. You know, maybe you can touch a little bit about uh, the planning process, Dr. Galvez, and tell us kind of your thoughts of what are some of the barriers here that you see. It's one of the big categories, and this is, again, following the three delays model uh, from public health. Um, So when we talk about planning, we think about uh, individuals when they want to make the decision to seek help. Uh, This would include whether they have actual health literacy to identify themselves as actually being sick, access opportunities uh, to actually get the test, seeing the opportunity to uh, recognize their symptoms. So are we really sick? Is how much this is going to cost me? Or, or because I heard something that, you know, my neighbor down the street did something else, this misinformation that has uh, actually ballooned with the COVID era um, has led to a lot of, you know, not getting the testing done. No, no, I, I think that's a great point. And it, to add to the health literacy, especially with undocumented immigrant workers and foreign workers are often disconnected from our healthcare system. And, you know, they can't seek social services, right? And so I think it's very important to, to drill this point of health literacy. Um, Also making criteria testing very clear. Exactly, very clear. And even like you said, for the migratory status, um, even when it's available, the thought perception that, oh my God, I could get deported if I seek medical help leads to this uh, issue of how am I gonna, why would I even get help? I'll just steal it on my own. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, transportation, availability, these are all multiple barriers that sometimes we kind of, you know, we don't see it as a big issues because sometimes we all take for granted. We all just hop on our vehicles, but not everybody has a car, especially in Southern California or certain places. Public transportation is not very, you know, available. And so getting to some places or if someone is disabled, imagine, you know, mobility. I know in the pediatric population, Dr. Galvez, what are some of the things that you see as some of these barriers within these kind of models? I think the big issue is, like, um, like you said, you have a single parent household usually, or you have a mom that's there and the dad's always away. How to manage, do I put my kid to be babysat while the other one, the sick one, goes? Uh, do I have to bring all my kids in to get tested? Where to get testing? How to get even help uh, babysitting? Or what do I do after? What's the outcome? What's going to happen? I'm, you know, one of the biggest fears I ran into a lot has been one kid ends up sick enough where he has to be hospitalized. But what do I do with my two or other three kids that may be sick but don't need hospitalization? So that's been always a barrier of how to, one per, one adult can manage multiple kids at various levels of disease. Yes, no, exactly. And then, unfortunately, you know, this disease is hitting a lot of our minority patient populations, not because we're more genetically predisposed. It just has to do with the social determinants of health and the stigma that goes associated with it being, you know, if you do now you go get tested, what happens if you're positive? You know, am I there are, you know, a lot of these workers are afraid or am I going to lose my job? This represents possible personal finances in terms of our being impact. You know, do you see this a lot in the families that you take care of? A lot. I think the big thing is we're in this economy where, you know, it's all about the hustle. Um, and a lot of these families' parents are usually either doing overdriving or they're doing 
you know, there are gardeners, there are cooks. Uh, I'm so missing a couple of days of work. Living the paycheck by check is huge. Um, and they know that can easily, they feel like they're going to be easily be replaced. So seeking help, trying to maybe avoid it, and hopefully thinking, okay, my child is healthy. He'll be okay and won't come in to get testing. Or the parent will end up going to work sick, exposing potentially all their coworkers and spreading the virus much faster rates. Yeah, exactly. So I think to summarize, there's you know three main huge model barriers that we kind of talked about very briefly, which is the planning, things like cost, testing, health literacy, you know, educating our patients and um, having information available. You know, misinformation is a huge thing. Availability of testing and the infrastructure providing you know patients with uh, disability an opportunity and the stigma. Um, from your opinion, what are some things that we could do to uh, very briefly to summarize and end this episode to kind of minimize some of these barriers? I think when you think about planning, you think about how do we fight misinformation. Misinformation means, you know, people like ourselves um, go to those communities or, or discuss out simplified the reasons of how to get testing, get the right information out there, go on to more podcasts, more interviews in Spanish language if available. I think that helps out a lot in these places. Uh, as far as processing, we think about, okay, how... What's going to happen? Where to get testing? Getting that information to the right hands, and that usually is promoting uh, to the local communities, uh, putting out posters, making sure that you know we're not looking for immigration statuses. We're not looking for. We just want you to get the right testing done, and then mitigating. As a physician, I think we are like empowered to be able to help these patients out. May sometimes we may have to make a phone call to the parent's boss and let them know, you know, this is true emergency and. You know, he should just give them a few days off so he can make the right medical decisions for those children. So it's been an advocate, not just treating the patient, but overall trying to help the family out in that situation. Exactly. No, I think it's important to, you know, we need to make this testing free. We need to make it available. We need to provide more education and protect our patients' rights and knowing that they need to, they can go get tested without any fear, or repercussions, or stigma. Dr. Galvez, it's always a pleasure. Hopefully we can have you back on. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Earn CME by clicking the link for credit. And be sure to check out the other podcast episodes in the library. <laughs>